members that are in the congregation this morning. So good morning to those of you that are joining us online from the comfort of your homes. Welcome to the house of the Lord this morning. My prayer for all of you is that you may feel the presence of the Holy One in your hearts and in your minds today, whether you are here physically in person um, or at home. May your space that you are residing in right now be the house of the Lord. Hear this call to worship this morning from Psalms 27, verses 4 and 5, and may it call us to worship today. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon the rock. May you dwell in his house today and may you feel his presence. If you're in the sanctuary with us, you would like to stand with us um, as our band comes and plays. Uh, we ask you not to sing, but may you be dwelling in his house now.
Hello. Good morning. Uh, Isaías 41, 1 a 7, 15 and 21. Isaiah 41, 1 a 7, 15 and 27. Calem-se diante de mim, ó oh Elias, que as nações renovem as suas forças, que elas se apresentem para se defender. Vamos encontrar-nos para decidir a questão. Quem despertou? O que vem do Oriente e o chamou em retidão ao seu serviço, entregando-lhe as nações e subjugando os reis diante dele. Isso com a espada... Ele os reduz a pó com o arco, os dispersa como palha. Ele os persegue e avança com segurança, por um caminho que seus pés jamais percorreram. Quem fez tudo isso? Quem chama as gerações à existência deste o princípio? Eu, o Senhor, que sou o primeiro e que sou o mesmo com os últimos. As ilhas viram isso e temem. Os confins da terra tremem. Eles se aproximem e vêm à frente. Cada um ajuda o outro e diz a seu irmão, seja forte. O artesão encoraja os orivos e aquele que alisa com o martelo incentiva o que bate na bigorna. Ele diz acerca das, da soldagem, está boa, e fixe o ídolo com prego para que não tombe. Vejo o que tornarei um debulhador, novo e cortante, com muitos dentes. Você debulhará os montes e esmagará e reduzirá as colinas à palha. Você irá peneirá-los, o vento os levará e a uma ventania os espalhará. Mas você o regozijará no Senhor e no Santo de Israel se gloriará. O pobre e o necessitado buscam água e não se encontram. Suas línguas estão ressequidas de sede. Mas eu, o Senhor, lhes responderei. Eu, o Deus de Israel, não os abandonarei. Abrirei os rios, as colinas estereis e fontes nos vales. Transformarei o deserto num lago e não ressequido em manancias. Porei no deserto o cedro, a acácia, a murta e a oliveira. Colocarei juntos no ermo o cipresto, o abeto e o pinheiro, para que o povo seja e saiba, e todos vejam e saibam, que a mão do Senhor fez isso, que o, o santo de Israel o criou. Exponham a sua causa, diz o Senhor, apresentem suas provas, diz o rei de Jacó. Palavra do Senhor, word of the Lord. Seems to be no way He works away 
I'm going to have them play through that song one more time um, as we kind of enter into our, our prayer time. Um, so as you find your place, your position of worship um, and prayer that you feel comfortable with, um, I just ask you to reflect on these, um, these lyrics because I feel like we're in a time and a place to where um, we need to rely on these, these lyrics and these words to help us get through. So as they play through this one more time, um, find that position, um, and let's talk to our Heavenly Father. Almighty God, all-powerful God of wisdom and strength, God of justice and mercy, God of faithfulness and grace, these are just some of the characteristics of who you are, and we're so thankful for those. A God so full of love for us that you sent your beloved Son to die on our cross for our sins, our iniquities, a love that we do not deserve, but you so freely give. Thank you, Father, for loving us despite the many times we have failed you. Help us to learn those characteristics and those qualities so that we can be more like you. Father, we are living in uncertain times today, Lord. This season of COVID is still affecting everyone across the country and all over the world. It seems like I'm seeing more and more cases every day. I ask that you be with the ones who are affected with this virus. Allow them to recover quickly, Father. Continue to be with the doctors and the scientists who are working so diligently to try and find a cure for this, violent, for, for this virus so that we can um, figure out how to continue to move forward with our lives without fear of this uncertainty with God, you are a God who cares for his people, so I pray that we will do so as well. We are called to love our neighbors and to treat their lives with respect. Help us to follow the guidelines and the precautions so that we can show how much we care about human lives. Be with our leadership. It's a difficult time to meet the needs of all the people, but I pray that the first priority is for health and safety of our people to continue to give those leaders a sense of guidance and discernment for the future. I also ask that you give our people a sense of guidance and discernment as we're coming up on a time of election. We are living in a nation that is so divided and so full of hate, Lord, and it's definitely not one nation united under God. I pray that we can have a leader that will bring our people back together, a leader that will seek after social injustice, a leader that will have such great love for his people that he will do anything to protect the lives of the oppressed and the marginalized. I pray for a leader who looks to you for wisdom and guidance for how to win this country. I also know that this vote this election isn't going to solve all of these problems, Lord. We have to be willing to step up and to fight for these issues. We have to be the ones that show grace and love and mercy to the world. Father, help us be your hands and feet in this world, shining light and shining love. Father, we are going through a difficult season, 
of loss and grief. I think about our brothers and sisters who are grieving this morning. We think of the Ferrer family, Lord, losing our dear brother, Gammy, Lord. We think about the Depina family, Lord, with the one year of Shannon's death today. We think about the countless other families who have lost loved ones during this time, Father. Words can't express how much we miss these people, Lord. But we rest in the assurance that we don't go through this alone. We have a church family who walks beside us and a loving Heavenly Father who is there to pick us up and to carry us when need be. Help us to rest in that promise. We are also going through a grieving period as a church. You have called your servant, Jim Abrams, to a new ministry opportunity. He has served this community faithfully for the past 16 years and has made enormous impacts in each of our lives, Father. We will miss him dearly and his family. However, we know that you call us, that when you call us, we have to answer that call. And sometimes that means leaving somewhere that we have definitely put down roots. We use, as we start this transition, Father, help us to prayerfully find a new direction and a new leader of this church and what you will call us to be, Lord. Continue to be at the staff and the board and the DS as we prayerfully navigate this transition. Father, I'm sure that there's a host of many different requests spread out across this congregation, in this sanctuary, and in the homes of our people, Lord. I pray that you give them a touch this morning, Lord, whether it be a physical touch, an emotional touch, mental, financial, whatever it is, Father, I pray that you touch them this morning, Father. Know that um, they have their church family praying for them and their Heavenly Father there with them. As we transition in our time of worship, Lord, I pray that you'll be with our brother Don Coombs as he come and brings your message today, Lord. Hide him behind the cross this morning. Allow his words to be your words, not his. Allow the words to challenge and encourage. Let us leave not the way that we came in this morning. We ask this in your precious and holy name. Amen. So, quick announcements before um, we transition. Um, offering. Um, if you have a chance, um, go to the church website, bethanynashchurch.com. Click on the giving link, and it's another way that we can continue to worship um, by giving of our tithes and offerings to God. Also, if you're here in person, you can always drop it into the box um, in the back of the sanctuary. Or if you happen to be by the church, you can stop in and give your tithes and offerings that way. Um, also, um, Beth, Miss Beth and Mr. Jim have been passing out directories um, as people have been coming in today. Um, folks that aren't here, if you want a directory, um, you can contact Miss Raquel and you can make an arrangement. We can get you a directory um, for that. Um, we don't have that many, so we're kind of limited to one family, um, one per family. Um, but we want to make sure that y'all keep up to date on uh, pictures and just contact information as it's changed over the years. So if you need one of those, make sure you can contact with Ms. Raquel or me or, or Julia. Um, we're also doing another tradition that we've been doing for many years in Thanksgiving baskets. Uh, I know many of you have participated in these baskets in the, in, the, in the past, and I know that you would love to continue to do that this year. So um, we are organizing that um, as we um, today. So if you go on the, the website, um, there's a sign-up list that you can sign up for whatever kind of donation that you want to give. Usually we have Ruth in the back with a big board and a sign-up list. This year it's going digital, um, but you can also contact Ms. Raquel as well in the office and kind of um, tell her what you want to donate. Um, so the last day that we're taking those donations is November 22nd. Um, so again, get in contact with me, go on the website, talk to Ms. Raquel about how we can continue to help these different families in our church and our, in the church um, and the people outside of our church um, so that we can help them have a, a great Thanksgiving season. Also, we are moving ever so quickly into our time of Advent. 
um, and we'll be going through this book that the Nazarene Publishing House, The Foundry, has put out, Let Her Earth Receive Her King. Um, especially during this time, so where we physically can't be together like we want to be, it's awesome to be able to go through this um, Advent devotional together and journey through it as a church, even if everyone's not here in person. So if you want a copy of this, um, it's $5. We have about 30 um, so you can either give me the money, Julie the money, uh, don't give Mr. Jim the money, he'll probably lose it. Um, just kidding, it's probably me. Um, but uh, we want to be able to journey together through this Advent season. So we'd love for you to pick up this copy. Um, so see me, Reverend Delgado, Julia, Miss Raquel, so we can get that arranged. And then lastly, final announcement, it's the kind of the attendance policy. Uh, we love to be able to gather together with one another but we can't exceed our, our number of 25. Um, and so we ask that you sign up Thursday or Friday. We cannot sign up before. Um, sign up Thursday or Friday, either with Ms. Raquel or online. Um, we want to continue to be able to meet, um, but we have to be vigilant about our numbers. Um, and so um, that, that number is 25, and we don't want to exceed that because we don't want to risk um, being a part of the problem and not part of the solution. Um, so kind of be mindful of that because um, we don't want to exceed that number. So announcements aside, uh, I want to uh, introduce our guest speaker for this morning, um, Reverend Don Coombs. He's a licensed mental health counselor as well as an orda ordained uh, elder in the church in Nazarene. Um, if you can remember about a year ago, um, this is about the time he came in last, last year to kind of talk about um, this issue of uh, mental health and, and substance abuse and different things like that. Um, so we're, we're so gracious and, and thankful that he was able to come again this year. So Reverend Don Coombs. Thank you. Well, good morning. Wonderful to be in the house of the Lord, amen? Uh, let's say that with a little bit more enthusiasm. Wonderful to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. I, I'll tell you, it's wonderful to be with you again. I remember being here last year, and we had a great conference, talked a lot about uh, substance abuse and how to help people uh, get into recovery. And um, a lot has really transpired in that year. A lot has really transpired. One of the things that... Um, I'd like for you to do this morning, if you would, would you turn to John chapter 11? John chapter 11. One of the things that has transpired is this whole COVID-19. I never saw that coming. I bet you never saw that coming as well. But one of the things that COVID-19 has really taught us is that our behavior affects other people. Our behavior affects other people. I noticed that this morning all of you have chosen to wear a mask, and that's because you know that your behavior affects other people. And you've decided this morning to be a blessing to other people. And I want to thank you for doing that. And uh, let's take and enjoy John chapter 11. We're going to look at the death of Lazarus and the resurrection of Lazarus. And this is so exciting, the resurrection that uh, Jesus performed of Lazarus. So looking at John chapter 11, now I'm reading from the English Standard Version this morning, and I uh, hope that you would join me in reading with that. Verse 1, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. For it is the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so... When he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? 
Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking a rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35. If you're taking notes and you don't mind, would you just underline these next two words? John eleven thirty five. 35. Would you underline Jesus wept? So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them say, could he not, he who opened the eyes of the blind man, have also kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account to the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hand and his feet, with linen strips, bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. 
Shall we pray? Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to read your word, John chapter 11, and to hear this wonderful story, this history, your history, you doing something in the life of Lazarus and Mary and Martha and others. And Lord, as we study this this morning, we pray that you would give us wisdom and discernment so that we may understand how to apply this message to our lives. And bottom line, Lord, when all is said and done, may you receive all the honor and glory, and may we receive all the good that you intend for us. Uh, we want to say it again, Lord. Jesus, we love you. We really love you. Thank you for being our Savior. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. One of the things I just want to point out, and if you're taking notes, just go to verse 5, and, and would you read verse 5 again with me? Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, verse 5. If you're taking notes, or you don't mind circling that in your Bible, if you would circle that word love. I want to remind you this morning, I don't know the last time you heard it, but I want to remind you that Jesus Christ loves you. Yes, he loves the entire world, John 3, 16, but I want to remind you this morning that Jesus Christ loves you. It's a personal love, not just a corporate love. And Jesus loved Lazarus, and he loved Martha, and he loved your sister, Mary. He loves and we can appeal to Christ with our needs because he does love us. Just like a wonderful brother or just like a wonderful sister, just like a wonderful parent, God loves it when you and I come before him and say, hey, I have a need. I have an issue. I think, Lord, that, that this is something that's going on in my life and I want to make sure that I've been honest with you and I've told you truthfully What's going on? I need your help. God loves it when we come to him with our needs. A Jesus' delay in responding to their request, it was a sign of confidence in the midst of calamity. Jesus, even though he had stayed there a few days, it, it was not a sign of, like, I don't care. No. It was nothing negative. It was not a sign of, I'm not there, so I, I'm disconnected. No, 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 none of those negative beliefs. The fact that Jesus waited a few days only demonstrates that we serve a God who is in control. Amen? Oh, you're still waking up. Good morning. Amen? Amen. 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 We serve a God who is still in control. And he's not hurried in responding to our needs. He knows the exact time to come and respond to the requests that you have before him. So for him to wait a few days, there was a timing that needed to take place so that they could see the power and the might of God Almighty at work. Jesus' delay in responding to their request was a sign of confidence and he is someone whom we can have our confidence. It's not a sign of calamity. Whatever challenges you face, know that our Savior is fully aware, ready to render aid, and waiting for the circumstances to be perfect to respond to your issue. Anybody else have some issues that they've been praying about for quite a while? I have to tell you, I, I have some prayer requests that it's been years that I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would move into someone's life or, or work in this particular situation. Uh, you and I can take comfort in God's word this morning that Jesus Christ is not hurried. He knows exactly what needs to happen when it needs to happen. He is omniscient. He knows everything. We're still trying to understand. He already knows God is not hurried by our interpretation of circumstances. Verse 6, state that he knew Lazarus was sick, but was not hurried in his need to respond. I want to remind you that we serve a God whose timing is perfect, and he is right on time. Would you look at, with me at verse 25? Would you look at verse 25? Number 2, Jesus is... The resurrection and the life. Jesus said in verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, 
though he die. It doesn't say he won't die. It says, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Trust me, folks, that when you and I die, when we breathe our laugh, last, we are going to go be with our blessed Savior. Amen? Amen. 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 That's where we're going to be. He is our resurrection and he is our life. Jesus is the giver of our life. All your days are definitely appointed. Jesus in, is in whom we believe regardless of the circumstances. Now, now I have to tell you, uh, since being here last year, by the way, thank you so much for having me come to your church a year ago. I really enjoyed that time that we were together and the, the moments of fellowship afterwards. That, that was just tremendous. It was a difficult day, though, for you. And, and there still tends to be difficult days, doesn't there? And in fact, with grief, we grieve for what was and for what should have been. Amen? Isn't that the way grief is? And yet time seems to kind of march on. You know, there are things that continue to happen. And, and since then, there's been a lot that has occurred in my life personally and professionally. Just a lot of things going on. But I thank the Lord that you and I can give our entire life to Christ. And we can pray this. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. And so all our days, Lord, thy kingdom come. May you be king, may this be your kingdom, and may you have full rule in your kingdom. Your kingdom come. May your will be done. Not my will, your will. And a lot does happen in a year. Well, let's take and, and look at point number three here. Point number three is... Jesus understands how we feel. Would you look at verse 35? I asked you earlier, if you don't mind, would you underline it? Uh, this, to me, is one of the most profound verses of the entire Bible. And yes, if you know Bible trivia, you're correct. It is the shortest verse in the Bible. You won Bible trivia. But to me, it's the most profound. In fact, when I was a youth pastor, we, um, we, we had a death in our youth group. A uh, person who uh, was affiliated in our school system uh, died. And it was just a short term after, time after that uh, my wife and I had moved there to be their youth pastors. And uh, one of the first events that we went to was this gentleman's funeral. And uh, when we met with youth group afterwards, how, how do you help a youth group through that? Well, we took and we went through the Gospel of John. And we studied how did Jesus cope with this? How did he cope with that? How did he cope with death? And, and what I love about this short verse, John eleven thirty five, 35, is that we serve a God who grieves at graves. There will never be a grave that you pass that God did not grieve at. There will never be a funeral that you don't attend that God is not there grieving going... This is sad. And no wonder, from a Christian point of view, from a, a biblical worldview, Genesis 1 through 3, it's normal. Everything after the fall is abnormal. So when God made man, he said, oh, this is very good. And we made all the creation and said, this is good. But man, very good. And when the fall happened after that, uh, we serve a God who grieves and graves. Because truly, everything after the fall is abnormal. Death, even though it's expected, it's abnormal. I love that John 11.35 teaches us that we have a God of empathy, not just sympathy. Sympathy is, you know, I'm, I'm sad for you. Empathy is, I'm right along with you. I'm grieving right with you. Now, what's awesome about this, and, and I love this, is that we serve a God who's going to grieve at a grave and yet is going to cause a resurrection. J just a few verses. All of a sudden, Lazarus comes out of the grave and yet he pauses to grieve 
at a grave. One of the best things to do is to go through the book of John and see how Jesus coped with this and with that. And, and we see how Jesus coped with death. He copes with death by grieving. It's okay for you and I to grieve. We can grieve for what was and what in our minds should have been. We, we can grieve. It's, it's okay. And yet, we can have hope. In the resurrection. Jesus demonstrates, and this is what I love, you know. He demonstrates authenticity. He grieves in the midst of hope. And in fact, you know, as a counselor, that's one of the things that, that I, I really look for. Is when somebody is able to do two emotions at the same time, that's pretty good. When we're only able to do one emotion, that's very concerning. When I'm working with someone and all they're able to do is grief, that really concerns me. When I'm working with someone and all they are is just depressed, that, that's very, very, very concerning. But when I'm working with somebody and they're grieving, but they have hope, or they're depressed and they have hope, or they're anxious, and yet they have trust, well, I'm not as concerned. And Jesus shows us that we can take and we can have grief, absolutely. But we can have hope as well. He demonstrates emotion in the midst of knowledge. For he says, and, and I think this is wonderful for us to embrace, that he is the resurrection and the life. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, number four. And I hope you take this as very strong encouragement. Would you look at verse 43? Jesus resurrects the dead by name. Jesus resurrects the dead by name. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice. Uh, with a loud voice. Verse 43, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. You know, it's very common to read a commentary, and you'll, you'll see the commentator say that it's a good thing that Jesus called him Lazarus, only his name, because others would have risen from the dead as well. We serve a mighty God. But that day it was Lazarus' time, and Jesus said to him, Lazarus, come out. There's a profound ministry in helping the resurrected remove their grave clothes. Did you notice that? Did you notice that we, you know, we looked at the ministry here, and we looked at the miracle here, but the miracle was that Lazarus came out, he was resurrected, but there was a ministry of helping Lazarus come out of the grave clothes. Now, that's the role of the church. You and I, we have this ministry that, that when God does a miracle in someone's life, there are some things that they are wearing. There are some things that are attached to them. They don't belong there anymore. It's our role. It is part of what Jesus wants you and I to do is to help remove that which no longer belongs, that which no longer applies to that person. There is a great ministry that God wants to do in people's lives. God wants his followers to help one another remove that which no longer belongs. And why? Because truly, and this last year has reminded you, we're in this together. We're in this together. When God does a miracle in your life, it is a testimony to the onlookers and a partnership to the followers. <coughs> Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you, Jesus, God Almighty, you're in this very room. And that you are the resurrection and that you are the life. And we thank you, just like Mary and Martha and even Lazarus, we can put our hope, our faith, our trust, our confidence. It's in you, Jesus Christ, that you really are the promised Messiah and that you are the resurrection. And Lord, thank you for teaching us that it's 100% appropriate to grieve at a grave and yet have hope in a resurrection. We thank you, Lord, that really, truly, it is the ministry of, 
of the body of Christ to take and remove that which no longer belongs in the person's life. We thank you, Lord, that you have called this church at this time in, in the ministry, the history of what you're doing for this area. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to equip and empower us to minister to your beloved children in this community. We thank you for the legacy, for the history of this church. And yet, Lord, we are so confident that you are at work and that you're doing even more. I pray your blessings upon your wonderful children. May your name be forever praised. May you receive all the glory. And may your beloved children receive all the good. Amen. He does know our name. He does know our thoughts. He you know, not only hears and sees our tears, but he empathizes with them. He grieves right there with us. I'm so thankful that Don was able to come and to deliver that special message for us today. Um, it's okay to grieve, but we do have that hope that we do not grieve alone and that we can continue with his strength. So I'll leave you with this, this benediction, that though we do grieve, and though death does happen, know that he grieves with us, 
and know that he carries us on and that he moves us on. I pray that we live into that promise as we go today. You're dismissed. Thank you.